So good morning, everyone. Um, we have a picture right here of an orange butterfly. Well, one of the first things I'm going to say is that not all orange butterflies in New Brunswick are orange, or sorry, are monarchs. Uh, there's about 80 species of butterflies in New Brunswick and several of them are orange, but the monarch butterfly is by far the largest and it's particularly uh, distinctive. So, so this is a story about the monarch butterfly, an amazing butterfly story, and it really is, you'll see. Uh, so what is the monarch butterfly? Well, it's a, a large butterfly, as I mentioned, and it is orange, black, and white. Uh, it's got very distinctive white uh, spe speckling all around the edges of its wings. As you can see, its uh, body color is orange, and it has black veining in the wings, along with the white spots. It's a large butterfly, about the width of a human hand, which is about 10 centimeters wide from wingtip to wingtip, as you can see. Um, it's a, a Latin name, Danis plexippus, and we're going to put up the first one here, and it's a female monarch butterfly. Uh, looks very much like what we just saw. Um, and if you look at this butterfly, what do we see? Well, we see obviously the, the colors, but we also see the veining in the wings, which is black, and these are actually having blood pass through them, and there are four wings on a butterfly. Uh, there's the four, F-O-R-E wings, here and here, and then there are two hind wings, another one here and another one here, and the overlap. So that's, that's a female monarch. Now, when I put up this next one, this is going to be a male. And <clears throat> what do you see that's different there? I'm looking at it and saying, well, they're the same size, so they're basically the same color. But if you notice on the male, the veining on the wings, these little black lines where the blood goes through, is finer and narrower than on the female. And there are two spots on the hind wing, one on each hind wing. And those are uh, uh, unique to the male. Uh, those are false pheromone sacs on the, on the wings. So the male has very fine uh, veining on the wings and it has pheromone sacs on the hind wings, which the female lacks. That's how we tell the difference. And it's important to try to sex those, as you'll find out as we go along in the presentation. Now, the next really important thing that you need to get in your mind is that the whole life cycle of the monarch butterfly revolves around milkweed, milkweed plants. And there's a whole family of these milkweed plants. Uh, they're uh, usually tall plants. Uh, they have quite large leaves on them and they exude a sticky sap, sort of a milky white sap, kind of thick. And we have two kinds of milkweed in New Brunswick, common milkweed, which you see here, and you can see the blooms are pink. And then there's another one, the, the leaves on this one are kind of paddle shaped. And the next one is called swamp milkweed. Both of these grow wild in New Brunswick uh, and they both have the pink flowers. And then the leaves on this one, the swamp milkweed are more sword shaped. Uh, narrower and more pointed. And <clears throat> the reason why it's so vital, these plants to monarch butterflies, is that that's the only plant that the monarch butterflies can lay their eggs on and have the eggs and the caterpillars develop into butterflies. It's a food plant for reproduction, milkweed. And we have two kinds in New Brunswick. Very important to understand because they can't reproduce on other plants except for milkweed. So, our story on the life cycle of the monarch starts in Mexico, way down in South Central Mexico, right at the bottom of what we can see here on the map. And it's, it's March, it's March. The butterflies have been down in Mexico for the winter and they're now ready to instinctively fly north. And they're going to fly north in search of milkweed to lay their eggs on. Uh, it's all instinctive and we're, they're not going to find it in Mexico. So they've got to fly north about 500 miles or more to get into Texas, Louisiana, or even Oklahoma, those three states where milkweed should be there sprouting out of the ground in early uh, April uh, or late March. So they head for there instinctively. And these monarchs have been uh, in Mexico all winter. And uh, at this time, their clock is ticking because they are running out of time in order to find milkweed and lay their eggs on it. It's almost a race against time and it's all instinctive, but pretty soon both sexes of monarchs that overwintered in Mexico are going to die. And hopefully they found milkweed and laid their eggs on it. So in late March, they fly north, 
Texas, Louisiana to find that first critical sprouting milkweed. If they don't find it, the next generation doesn't happen and these butterflies have, have literally not reproduced at all. Their sole objective, all instinctive, find that fresh milkweed and lay eggs on it before they die. And then both sexes do die after a life of eight months. They were born last August, they flew to Mexico, they spent the winter there, and now it's early April and they're, they're laying their eggs and then they're going to die. All part of the life cycle. But once the eggs are laid, then the next generation has been started. So <clears throat> the monarch butterfly is born from April, that's like now, to early August, that is when they're gonna to start to migrate again, are only gonna live two to six weeks. The ones that were in Mexico over the winter, eight months. So this is completely different. Their instinct of these next generations, and there's going to be more than one, is to find fresh milkweed further north, mate, lay eggs, and then they die. And both sexes have a similar lifespan. This is all part of the life cycle, and it's all instinctive and governed basically by the length of the days. So when do they reach New Brunswick? Because we're right up at the far corner of where milkweed grows. It doesn't grow much further northeast than where we are. It usually takes two to three generations of monarch butterflies coming north following the emerging milkweed. And each generation, remembering now that they laid their eggs uh, before they died in the, in the south, uh, is about a month to develop. They, the eggs hatch, they become caterpillars, the caterpillars grow, the caterpillars go into a chrysalis or a, a cocoon, and then they eventually become butterflies. It takes just about 30 days. So if you can imagine laying the eggs in early April, there's a generation that's gonna take April to develop, then another generation that'll probably take May, and then another one in June. So two to three generations coming north to reach New Brunswick and the Maritimes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we are the northeast limit of milkweed, as I mentioned. So historically, we only got limited numbers of monarchs here, most arriving in late June, or early July, so about three generations to get here. By the July, there are almost always reports of, in New Brunswick of caterpillars on uh, milkweed. And common milkweed is the widest spread of the two species we have. So here, we're gonna get into some action here. <laughs> First of all, this is, a, this is a female monarch butterfly. She's just arrived on a fresh milkweed plant. It's still growing, the leaves are straight up. She flies in, she smells it. She can smell it from a long way away and she wants to lay eggs on it. <clears throat> so she clasps the leaf with her one of her forelegs. You can see it there. And she curls her abdomen and she deposits a little tiny egg on the underside, the underside of the leaf. Why the underside? Well, if it rains, the leaf, the, the leaf will be more flat pretty soon and the egg won't be washed off. And on the underside of the leaf, it's kind of fuzzy on the underside. And that's useful for the little caterpillar later on. So here are fresh monarch eggs on milkweed. See those little tiny, almost the size of the head of a pin, one, two, three eggs that have been laid by the female on the milkweed. And they're just gonna be there and she's gonna go on, she's gonna find more milkweed and she's gonna lay anywhere from 400 to 600 eggs over her lifetime. Remembering that her lifetime is only gonna be fairly short, two to six weeks. Here, is a close-up of an egg. And this was taken by our friend Bev England, who lives right here in Quispam Sis. Uh, she's an excellent photographer, macro photographer. This is an egg. It looks like a little football, size of a head of a pin. And look at the sort of fuzzy underside of the milkweed leaf <clears throat> that she's laid the egg on. And it's, it sticks on with a little bit of sort of like an adhesive on the end of it that sticks nicely onto the, the, the lower part of the, the underside of the milkweed leaf. Three days in, the egg starts to change. Something's happening. It becomes dark. There's something in there. And suddenly, pop. And she managed to catch this. I've never seen these pictures anywhere else, in books or anywhere else. This little guy is coming out. It's a little tiny caterpillar, so small, remembering that that egg's the size of a head of a pin, that you can barely see it. And he crawls out, and the first thing he does, he turns around and he eats the the, the uh, egg shell to recycle the nourishment that's in there. And then the little tiny caterpillar, ravenously hungry, wants to grow. He starts to eat 
when he's got such small mouth parts, he has to start eating the little hair-like structures on the bottom of the leaf until he can grow big enough to then start eating the leaf itself. So the, the purpose of milkweed is to be <clears throat> provide food for these caterpillars when they hatch from their eggs. So pretty soon, the caterpillar starts to grow. And like a lobster or like a snake, uh, after the caterpillar has grown to a certain point, it sheds its skin. It has a new skin that's more elastic to allow it to grow more. And it goes through five different stages before it becomes uh, large enough to go into a cocoon. And it, it, we call it a chrysalis. So a little tiny guy that we just saw would morph into something the size of this next one that you see on the left, and then becomes bigger and becomes bigger. By the time it gets almost ready to go into chrysalis, it's about the size of your little finger, your baby finger. Pretty good size. And uh, chowing down like crazy on the milkweed leaves. So there needs to be lots of milkweed to keep these little guys going because they're really, really hungry. And that's, the color is very distinctive. It's the only caterpillar we have that's yellow, white, and black with these bands on it. So real easy to identify. Now, <clears throat> for demonstration purposes, we uh, actually raise caterpillars uh, indoors, or actually outdoors, but uh, in an old aquarium. Uh, and what happens when the caterpillars uh, get big enough to go into chrysalis, Normally, they crawl away from the milkweed patch and they go to shrubbery somewhere close by and they become a chrysalis. Well, when you're doing it this way, we put the milkweed plants in an aquarium in water and then we put a screen on the top so the little guys can't crawl out when they're ready to go into chrysalis. They have to form their chrysalis on the roof of the aquarium. And so here we have a, uh, a, a caterpillar that's big as your little finger um, in its final instar and it's uh, stopped feeding and is ready to pupate or go into, uh, into chrysalis. So it, it can't get out. So what it does, it instinctively spins a little pad of silk right where the wires cross. And you can see that right up here. That's a little silk pad that it, it spins out of its, its rear end. And then it hooks its rear end into the, uh, into the pad. And it's very, very tough stuff. And uh, so now it lets go and it, it falls straight down. And pretty soon it curls <coughs> into what we call a J shape. Now this is, you know, it looks big in the picture, but it's about the size of your little finger. Now, if you take your finger, the one closest to your thumb and just bend it right on the knuckle, you can see that that's where the skin stretches the most. And what this caterpillar wants to do is to split the skin right here, right, right down the midline on its back in order to get rid of that skin and enable it to go into chrysalis. So it kind of does that. And if it has to, it'll intake uh, in extra air into its thorax, like taking a deep breath and expand itself and stretch and stretch, try to get that split. So watch what happens. Uh, this only takes about two minutes. And once it splits, it's very quick. It wants to get rid of that skin. So here we go. It's, it pops. And then look at this. This happens within two minutes. Suddenly the skin becomes excess baggage, wants to get rid of it. It's kind of just curls up and it basically just is able to Click the skin off, and now we've got something altogether different, a completely different looking animal. It's no longer a caterpillar. It's still hooked into that little pad, and it's turning into something called a chrysalis. Eventually, it has to dry, constrict, uh, become a completely different thing, and within an hour, it looks more like this. And in the, in the wild, this would be on a shrub. So let's go leave the aquarium now and go to one that actually is on a shrub. And this is day one after it has dried and, and become you know, a kind of a hardened chrysalis with a, kind of like an exterior shell on it. And you notice the little gold spots, very distinctive. It's green, so it blends in with leaves and whatever in the shrubbery, the foliage. And it has a half circle of black and gold on it as well. And uh, that's just around half the top of it. So this is what it looks like. And it just quietly hangs there, very vulnerable if anything came along, like a bird or a mouse or something. But hopefully it's, it's, it's protected and blends right in. So time has to pass, nothing moving there. But after about nine to 11 days, nine to 11 days in the summertime, uh, something will happen. Because constantly things are developing inside this, sort of like an egg, actually. 
but it's a chrysalis. On day 11, in this case, suddenly the green becomes clear and we now see something inside that kind of looks familiar. That's a monarch butterfly all curled up in this little jewel case, uh, like a flag stuffed into a bag, really. And, but we can see the wing, we can see the pattern. We know something's about to happen. So the next morning, usually this happens in an afternoon, and the next morning, we're going to see the emergence of a monarch butterfly from this chrysalis. And my wife took these pictures. I had to go fishing that day. So she took the pictures. <laughs> and so what we see suddenly right here, there's a split right here. This happens just, you know, you have to watch all the time. And what we're going to see next is the emergence that again happens only within a couple of minutes. So it pops, pops, and pops. And suddenly out comes, well, it kind of looks like a butterfly, but it's got this incredibly huge abdomen and little tiny wings. So it kind of looks like a butterfly, but what's going to happen? Well, it has to pump the blood from that really engorged abdomen into its wings. So it turns around, clasps the now empty chrysalis shell and starts to pump the blood. And of course it uses gravity to help the wings expand. And the other thing it has to do here is a curled up feeding tube uh, called a proboscis. And it's what it's going to use to take nectar out of flowers later on as an adult butterfly, because that's what it's going to feed on as an adult. And it's in two halves, and it has to get the proboscis kind of knitted together, almost like the, the veins of a feather, little hooks on it. And so it's got to do that at one end of itself, and it's got to pump the blood at the other end. So it's a busy little critter for about a few hours. So that was about five minutes after emergence. And about an hour and a half later, look what we've got. We've got a beautiful monarch butterfly, perfect. All it has to do for the rest of the day is to dry its wings because the wings are you know, damp and it's got its proboscis together. It looks like a round tube now all curled up. And so it'll hang there very quietly for the rest of the day. And probably just before nightfall, because it did emerge by the way in the morning, typically, just before nightfall, it will take its first flight. It's never flown before and likely leaves the chrysalis uh, location and fly to some tall tree to spend the night uh, on a branch somewhere. All very amazing stuff. So one of the things I always say is that monarch butterflies are the perfect thing to introduce kids and adults to nature. Uh, butterflies are close to the ground, they go from flower to flower, and this, they've got these amazing life stories. So let's come back to the relationship between monarchs and milkweed. Very, very critical. Remembering that the caterpillars needed to feed on, but the adult butterflies no longer need it except to lay their eggs on. The adult butterflies are going to feed now on flower nectar, flowers, various kinds, blooming flowers, including milkweed flowers sometimes, but they're not dependent on milkweed. Any flower will do as long as it has nectar. So. Milkweed is a sole food plant for the caterpillars only. Uh, reproduction, obviously, totally dependent on availability of milkweed plants. We have two kinds in New Brunswick. Uh, there's a hundred species in North America of milkweed, but only about a dozen used by monarchs for breeding. Don't know why, but that's what it is. The sap, that sticky white sap that I mentioned, that's copious. It's really, really thick and, and really flows out of a, if you break off a leaf has an actual poison in it, a, a slight poison, and it's not harmful to the monarchs, but because the caterpillars eat nothing but milkweed, including the sap, it imbues their cells with this poison. So now the caterpillar and also the adult monarch, when it comes out, has, is, is actually slightly poisonous. And that doesn't hurt too much. It doesn't hurt the butterfly, obviously, but it's, it's helpful if you're going to migrate all the way to Mexico and something's going to take a run at you, uh, if you don't feel it, don't don't uh, taste good, uh, it uh, it probably is is helpful. I have actually seen um, actually a merlin is a is a small falcon, smaller than a peregrine. I've seen a merlins which catch butterflies and, and uh, other insects, large insects. I've actually seen them catch a monarch, go to bite it, and then let it go because it didn't taste good. So. 
we have these spring and summer monarchs generations that have made it from Texas all the way up um, every six weeks dying and another generation uh, getting to southern Canada, including New Brunswick by J July, and then having one generation here until early August, uh, the next generation, unlike the monarchs of spring and early summer, those born after early August, which would be the next generation here, they live up to eight months. And the reason for that is the length of the days. The days are getting shorter. And by the point, a certain point when they get to be only a certain length and the angle of the sun in the sky, the arc of the sun is low enough, below 57 degrees, those butterflies stop reproducing. No more sex. <laughs> they just, they, they, they have to continue to live and instinctively get ready to migrate to Mexico. And so they're gonna migrate to Mexico, that last generation of summer, winter there, and then return as far as Texas the next spring to repeat the cycle. So they change. The monarch butterflies by mid-August, they're still with us, but the shorter days is a stimulus to cease breeding. Like birds, the monarchs become restless. They become hungry, they begin to store lipids, fats, which they get from the nectar in plants, blooming plants. They begin a 4,000 kilometer migration to Mexico, all instinctive because none of this generation has ever gone before. And they're not going to have their parents or their grandparents to show them the way. It's all programmed into that, into that mind when the, when the butterfly becomes uh, becomes uh, emerged from the, uh, the chrysalis. And uh, they don't go in flocks like birds do. They go individually, but the instinct to migrate and the direction to migrate in to get the right destination is imbued in each of them. So they kind of all follow the same path, more or less, same general direction to get to Mexico. Now, how do we know where they go? How do we first find out? And how do we know how they get there? Well, the first uh, discovery of the monarchs in Mexico, because scientists here in North America didn't know where they went. They knew they migrated because they'd been seen going south. Didn't have any idea of the eventual destination. The University of Toronto started a tagging pro pro program way back uh, in the early, I think in the 1930s and 40s. And eventually that resulted in the discovery of the wintering areas in Mexico because people would see the tag monarchs and re report them. And so the, the, the tracking down there eventually broadened and broadened further over the border into Mexico and finally into the mountains of Mexico, which we're going to talk about next. Uh, the University of Kansas now sponsors a monarch watch, it's called the entomology department to track the southward migration. Tagging is still done, but the purpose of it is to try and determine the major migration routes so that those migration routes can be identified, preserved, and perhaps enhanced with blooming plants because that's what they need in order to fuel their migration. So the University of Kansas is now doing this, providing numbered adhesive wing tags, believe it or not, a little tag that goes on the wing of the butterfly. Uh, there's an online database for matching butterfly tagging information and subsequent sightings further down the, towards the south. And the Mexicans down in Mexico, where the, the butterflies winter, are paid $5 for each recovery of a tag if they can find them. But they're not allowed down there to touch the monarchs or to take tags off living monarch butterflies. They have to look for uh, d dead monarchs that might happen to fall from the trees. We're gonna go there in a minute. I'll show you what that's like uh, because um, it's a sanctuary. And of course, they want to be preserved down there. So we haven't left New Brunswick yet, but one of the best monarch locations for migrating monarchs to be tagged is Point Le Pro, down where the nuclear plant is, not far from St. John, just down the coast. Uh, the monarchs tend to follow the coastlines, they follow mountain ranges, they follow major river valleys, they also follow major highways on their way gradually, gradually southwest toward Mexico. So when they reach the coast here in the Bay of Fundy, they tend to follow it and they follow right out onto the tip of Point Le Pro where wild thistle grows and some other plants. In fact, there's a wonderful variety of plants in the open areas at the tip of Point Le Pro. 
And our St. John Natchez Club has an observatory there for birds, migrating seabirds. And we realize it's an excellent place for accumulating monarch butterflies in the fall. And we started a tagging program in 2006. They come to the thistle, they come to asters that grow there in profusion. This is all blooming plants with nectar. And they stop before they move on because the next flight is probably going to be over the water toward the coast of Maine, of Ramanan, and then on to Maine. And so it's, a, it's kind of a refueling spot. And so we've got goldenrod as well, which is a really highly nutritious uh, plant with lots of nectar in it. So they stop, they fuel up, and then they move on. And that's when we're able to catch some, tag them, and then they go, some, a lot of them go right back to feeding again, and then they move on with the tag attached. So here is a monarch butterfly on its migration from mid-August onward. We don't tag till the middle of August to be sure we're going to get migrating butterflies. And uh, it's feeding on thistle, which is the very best. It's the best not nectaring plant we have. This is a tag. It looks the size of a football, but in fact, it's only about a centimeter in diameter. It has a, uh, a website, talks about Monarch Watch on it, and it has a unique seven unit or seven digit uh, uh, number. In this case, the first one is APBP087. That's unique to that tag, 088, 092, 093. And they come like postage stamps uh, used to be on the uh, on tags where you can just, or sorry, on sheets where you can just peel them off with a special device. We have a special device to do that. And we then put the tag on the wing of the Monarch butterfly on the underside of the wing in a special spot in accordance with the protocols that Monarch Watch uh, uh, gives us. We record all the data, the number, the date, the sex, was it a male or a female, when we did it and where we did it. And that eventually goes into the database that's maintained by Monarch Watch. And if there's a, a match down the line somewhere or in Mexico, uh, then there's a, a, an alert goes out and we've got a match and uh, we get information about that sighting, which is really cool. So here is a tagged Monarch. We put the tag on the underwing in a certain spot, doesn't affect their flight. It uh, doesn't seem to bother them. They get all the way to Mexico, many, many recoveries from down there by various people across North America, and we let it go. We let it go right back where the plants are so that it can go back to nectaring if it hasn't finished. So now the monarch migration south has begun. And of course, we're here in New Brunswick. This line basically is roughly where milkweed grows in North America. So we're just about the St. John River Valley in New Brunswick, but milkweed is slowly increasing to the east in New Brunswick. And we'll talk about a bit about that later on. Uh, but the monarchs from here would have to come all the way down, presumably um, along the Atlantic seaboard, down through South Texas, where a lot of them concentrate going through, and then on down to the neo-volcanic belt of mountains in South Central Mexico. Now this is all of the monarchs east of the Rocky Mountains. And they, they make it all the way across Canada, all the way to the Rockies. There's a, another population to the west of the Rockies that winters in California, but it's much, much smaller. Uh, this one is one we're talking about here. So our monarchs fly a long way to get there. We're the furthest away, basically, of anywhere here uh, in, in New Brunswick where monarchs are typically tagged. So off it goes, off they go, carrying our tags. Now, winter in Mexico, what is that like for the monarchs? These monarchs have never been there before. How do they know where to go? It's all instinctive. And they all aggregate there in a very small area. They arrive in the neo-volcanic neo mountains by early November. They start migrating in mid-August. From here, it takes about two months, a little less than two months to make their way down there all kinds of obstacles, hazards, etc. Hopefully they make it. They spend the winter kind of all grouped together in dense colonies on mature fir trees, a specific kind, OML fir trees, they're big tall trees, 70, 80, 90 feet tall, at an altitude of 9,000 to 12,000 feet. Way, way up. I should have this in meters for you guys, but anyway, that's a long way up, right at the mountaintops. And it's only a small area. It's only 160 square kilometers, 60 square miles. How do they know? But the, the, the climate there is perfect for them. The big trees provide like an umbrella uh, canopy and there's just the right humidity. It doesn't freeze there normally. 
and it gives them a place where they are safe, no disruptions, and they can spend the winter quietly <clears throat> before starting the migration back to Texas in the spring. Some colonies were informally estimated at 70 million butterflies, 70 million. Colonies were first discovered by scientists in 1975 because of the tagging, the pioneering tagging efforts of the University of Toronto. National Geographic announced the first discovery of the thousands, millions of monarchs in 1976. It was found in 1975 in the winter and in 1976 this came out. And when I saw this magazine, I said, I'd love to go there someday. And we did. My wife and I went down with some friends in 2007 in the winter. And these are photographs that we took. This is down at the lower reaches of these neovolcanic mountains. If you look up at the top, way up here, this would be where the monarchs would be on the tops of some of the tallest mountains in these big stands of OML fir. So when we went there, we had to acclimatize. We went with a guide. Uh, we stayed in a beautiful hacienda down there. And eventually when we were somewhat acclimatized, we climbed the mountain and went up a little path that took us up, up, up. We drove as far as we could and we had to hike another two or three thousand feet and eventually we came to the first oil mill furs and what do we find but clumps of monarch butterflies they grouped together it was in march uh, mid-march and the sun was getting stronger it's cold up there actually during the winter almost freezing sun was getting stronger days getting longer monarchs starting to move around they were nectaring on some of the plants that's high up there and they were getting water at the brooks and there were on the sides of the trees, look at this, where the, where the sun was shining in, they were hanging from the branches. When they, sun, sometimes they would all fly at one time and you could actually hear their wings, like the rustling of, it was no wind, but the rustling of wind, say in the aspen trees or some of the trees in the summer. It was amazing. And when we went there, we were very careful not to step on them. They moved out of the way. They were on the ground, they were everywhere. And we took pictures, of course. And at first we were talking in normal tones. And by the time we were there 15 minutes, we were whispering to each other. It was so incredible. The air was full of monarch butterflies. Look at that. It's just absolutely amazing. It was one of the most amazing things. In fact, I think the most amazing thing that I've ever seen in nature, and I've seen a lot of stuff, but this was just, and if you ever have a chance to go, go there. So how do we know how the monarchs are doing? Well, these monarchs spend the winter on these OML firs clumped together. And from the air, the trees actually look orange. And so in order to estimate the number of monarchs wintering in these areas, remember again, it's only a small area. Uh, World Wildlife Fund and a number of other agencies, uh, you know, international agencies have, have a program where every winter they do aerial photographs of the entire area and then estimate how many square hectares of monarchs are wintering. And that's really the only way, because they're all together, more or less in one area, that you can estimate from winter to winter and year to year how the monarch population is doing east of the Rockies. And so the numbers have not been announced for this past winter yet. They're pending any day now, practically. But what they do, they take these aerial photographs and then they estimate the number of hectares. Now this graph that I'm going to show you is runs from 1994, 95, that first winter, all the way through to last winter. What do you notice about this graph? Now this is a graph that shows the number of square hectares of wintering monarchs, bearing in mind that every hectare would have, you know, millions, millions and millions of monarchs in it. Uh, the highest was, 1996, 97, 18 square hectares. That doesn't sound like a very big area, but that's the cumulative number. But there's millions upon millions upon millions, billions at that time of monarchs included in that. What's the general trend down? At, in 19, 2013, 14, it was down to less than one hectare. And it was fears that next year, the monarch butterfly population could be completely gone. It rallied and has rallied up and down, a little bit of a rally, but the last couple of years down. So really what's going to happen this next year, it's expected it's going to bump up again, maybe 
to four to six this winter, but we haven't heard the official word yet. But the big takeaway here is that monarchs are indeed in trouble. How come? What's happening? A lot of work being done because they migrate from Canada to the United States to Mexico. All three uh, governments and agencies within those, those three countries have been working on this and they have found some conclusions. It took a while, but there's some pretty big factors and each of those is being worked on now to try to uh, mitigate the decline and to, uh, to, to help the monarchs recover. So what are the threats? What are the threats? Well, the first logging at the Mexican winter sanctuaries. It's a poor area. Those big OML firs are very valuable pieces of timber. Um, there's a lot of illegal stuff goes on in Mexico, even though it's a sanctuary, money is important. Money buys some illegal things sometimes. So logging, and if logging uh, breaks up the canopy where these butterflies are, are, then the colder weather can get in and they can freeze. The rain uh, winds can be more extreme. They're not protected. And so breaking up the canopy is very, very serious. And logging is a problem because some of the butterflies die through freezing, et cetera, as a result. A lack of milkweed. Well, it hasn't been helpful that there's been a drought in recent years in Southern United States where that first critical milkweed grows in the spring and didn't grow very well. But the use of herbicides, and I'm gonna tell you more about that in a minute, is a big, big factor. Uh, so we'll come back to that one. Herbicide use in certain areas. Lack of blooming flowers on migration south. Really interesting. Hadn't thought of that, eh? They have to have nectar from blooming flowers in their migration. And roadside mowing. So many states and provinces, including New Brunswick, have the habit of mowing down the plants along the roadsides in late summer, the very time when monarchs are moving south. And also urban sprawl, meaning that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's more and more paved areas less and less areas where there's blooming plants. So that's a factor. Um, these all, there's no one single thing that's causing all this, but that's another factor. Uh, winter storms, now obviously combined with the logging has had an effect. Sometimes there's been big freezes of monarchs and they, they can't stand it beyond a certain amount and they, 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 big numbers of them have died. And we don't know about climate change over the long term. What does that mean? It could be good, or it might not be, depending. Certainly, more violent storms aren't going to be helpful, but perhaps climate change over the long term is going to be helpful in other ways. That's an open question at the moment. Coming back to the use of herbicides. Prior to the last couple of decades, down in Texas, remembering that the monarchs coming out of Mexico in the spring the clock is ticking, they're going to die, they have to find milkweed plants in order to lay their eggs on before they die, so that next generation can continue the population. This is a big field of, I think this is corn or maybe soybean. We were birding down in South Texas in the spring, and I took this picture just to illustrate, it's like a prairie down there, huge, vast areas devoted to soybean and corn growing. Prior to a couple of decades ago, milkweed plants, uh, common milkweed, I think, grew between the rows as weeds and around the perimeter of the fields profusely. It was really common in agricultural areas, but it was a problem for the farmers. Monsanto, the seed producing company and chemical company, uh, was able to do genetic modification of the soybean and the corn seed such that the seeds could be planted, the new sprouts come up, and these new sprouts are genetically modified. And so now they can broadcast herbicides over the entire field, the entire area, kill all the weeds, including milkweed. And now when the monarchs come back, they don't have any milkweed to lay their eggs on. That is apparently the single biggest factor in the abrupt decline of monarch butterflies. It took a while to figure it out, but that is a problem. So now there's a big effort underway down in those areas to reintroduce monarch or uh, uh, milkweeds uh, to these places. Uh, they still have to grow their soybeans and all that, but there's a big effort to try and proliferate milkweed uh, to replace what would be lost in the farming areas. So that's a critical one. So I'm gonna wind this down here in a few minutes. Uh, what can we do? 
okay? There's not much we can do about the monarch sanctuaries because that's a long way away. Can't stop the logging, but other people are going to work on that. The government of Mexico is making big efforts. But what can we do, you and I and everybody else in New Brunswick? We can plant milkweed because we don't have a lot of it here. Uh, we haven't had, uh, remember the limit of milkweed was about the St. John River Valley, but we can plant milkweed, either common or swamp. And you're doing that, you're about to do that because you've got some seeds. Uh, protect the wild milkweed that we have. Don't take it for granted. Unfortunately, uh, milkweed is kind of a negative term. If it was milk plant, <laughs> it would probably have a better reputation. Uh, agricultural people don't like it either because if cows eat milkweed, um, it doesn't, doesn't kill them. But they, if they munch on it, it will put a taste in the milk that is not pleasant apparently. So um, agriculturalists don't like milkweed growing in pastures. Uh, so it was a little bit of a, you know, a negative idea about milkweed that has to be overcome or balanced with the positive aspects toward monarch butterflies. Uh, it's sort of been one-sided from the agricultural world that milkweed is bad. Well, it is bad from that standpoint, but it's very important for monarch butterflies and other uh, pollinators uh, because the, the milkweed blooms are very, very good for pollination for, for nectar sources. Uh, preserve blooming roadside plants. Every state and province should be changing the timing of that mowing. You, you can still mow but don't mow at the prime time the monarchs are moving through. Make it a little later in the fall. Make it after the monarchs have passed through. You can still mow and you know keep bushes down and all that, but not while the plants are in full bloom. That's something that every state and province is, is working on or people are trying to get that changed. And I hope it can be done in New Brunswick. Support monarch conservation efforts. Absolutely. Now that we understand the life cycle and the importance of preserving monarchs, Promote monarch awareness with family, friends, and the public. And you guys are about to do that. There's a school project, as I understand it. And learn about potential risks of herbicide use. Absolutely. And it's not just in those agricultural areas, but it's herbicide use anywhere. Gardeners often use herbicides, but you've got to be very careful with it. And you've got to remember that what kills one insect can certainly affect another. And uh, it's, uh, there's got to be other ways to do things. Now, I want to throw this one in because uh, <clears throat> the Monarch Watch, this is tagging. We're looking at uh, a, a tagging worksheet here on the left that uh, is where we record the information and then it goes into the database at the University of Kansas. So on the left at that particular year was 2012, uh, our series of tags was RAT, 925, 26, 27. Uh, the date we were tagging, uh, August 29th, uh, August 30th, uh, male, females, the sex. Was it wild or reared like in an aquarium? That's important. Just make sure that they all make it down to Mexico. We want to see if that happens. And then where did you uh, tag the monarch? Uh, that's all goes into the database. Well, uh, people go down in Mexico in the, in the winter, toward the end of winter, and they... Uh, they go around to the sanctuaries and talk to the local people because the local people are looking for the monarchs that died naturally and fell to the ground over the winter. And there are always some attrition. If you've got millions of butterflies, some of them are going to die and fall to the ground. There's also a couple of birds down there that do feed on monarchs and they kill some of them. And there's a, a, a little rodent, a little mouse that also can feed and doesn't seem to be affected by the bad taste or the mild poison. So they buy these tags, five bucks each. And they bring them back and they enter, him into, enter them into the Monarch Watch system. Well, one of those tags, RAT935, which was tagged August 30th, 2012. It was a male, wild, tagged at Point Pro. Guess what? This is a tag recovery from Mexico. That little tag flew all the way from Point Pro in New Brunswick to El Rosario, which is one of the... One of the, the uh, sanctuary mountaintops that Jean and I actually visited in 2007. One of our butterflies flew from Point Lepro, New Brunswick, all the way there and was recovered. That's the tag. I actually got that lady who bought it from Mexico, the Mexican, to send me a, a picture of the tag so I'd have it. That's our tagging sheet. 
And coming out of that recovery is a certificate of appreciation from uh, Monarch, uh, Monarch Watch at the University of Kansas. That tag, RAT-935, traveled 4,251 kilometers, 2642 miles, straight line, because we don't know whether the butterfly went straight or not, but it went at least 4,251 kilometers from New Brunswick, Canada to South Central Mexico on the wing of a monarch. Unfortunately, the monarch died over the winter, but at least we know our monarchs make it. And we had a second recovery uh, that same winter. Um, I won't repeat, but it was the same distance. And uh, it was a bit of a die off there. It was kind of a cold winter and they had some freezing and some of these monarchs didn't make it through to spring. But anyway, amazing stuff, amazing. So I wanna wrap this up. This is the final slide. I'm gonna open up for questions. Uh, this is a monarch butterfly, and that is a little tiny egg the size of the head of a pin. And in that little egg is all the genetic programming that's needed to cause that butterfly to know enough to eat milkweed, to start off as a little microscopic guy and grow into a big fat caterpillar, then go into chrysalis, then become a butterfly, and then travel either north or south, depending. And if it's one that's traveling north, it's got to know what to do. If it's one that's the last generation of summer, and it's going to live eight months, it's never been to Mexico, it's going to have to find its way there and join all its fellows on the top of some mountain and spend the winter and go back to Mexico the next spring. It's all there and it's pretty amazing stuff. So that's the end of my story. And hopefully you now have a better understanding of the life cycle of the monarch butterfly.